Jesus Christ. And our topic of consideration this evening is an exciting one. And we hope in our time together to share with you some of what the Bible says regarding the future of this earth. So typically when we talk about good news and bad news, and you're asked, do you want the good news or the bad news first? Most will say, well, give me the bad news. And then you end on good news. So we're going to start with a little bit of bad news in, in regards to the current problem that's facing this earth. You see, it's an undeniable fact that, on the whole, the world in which we live is in a state of suffering. The circumstances of this globe are such that there are numerous problems without nearly as many permanent solutions. If you were to pick up a newspaper, surf the internet, or turn on the news, there will be an article or a report on some crisis that the world is currently dealing with. It's almost always bad news, isn't it? I know that's my experience. Driving home, I may turn on WJR 950 on the AM dial. It's always bad news. Maybe just a little bit here and there. You see, this earth is faced with a lot of crises. There's an economic crisis. There's a pollution crisis. A population crisis. A political crisis. Poverty is abundant in many parts of the world, as is disease, famine, and drought. You see, sometimes we find ourselves living in a little bit of a bubble here in the United States. But if we look outside the United States, the world is a big place, and there are many, many challenges and problems it is facing at this present time. Violence is rampant throughout all countries, whether in the form of terrorism, murder, rape, crime, and so on, and the prevalence of immorality, corruption, vice, and drug addiction also indicate that something is seriously lacking in modern civilization. Furthermore, on the domestic front here in the United States, things are really much less depressing. This nation is torn apart by dissension, hopefully divided on issues both small and great. And this will be illustrated for us in, in a very large way in the upcoming election in the next year. Young people are disillusioned, discontented, and unhappy. The Western world exists in an environment of permissiveness, violence, and crime. And the very fabric of family living has been shaken at its foundation with more and more children living in broken homes. A sense of insecurity pervades society, which is reflected in things like the rising divorce rate, family disloyalty, rebellion against authority, lethargy, and immorality. So is it really any surprise then that many are troubled by this planet's current state of affairs and uncertain as to what the future holds? This globe is plagued with problems that defy solutions, problems which, despite mankind's best efforts, don't appear to be getting any better. It's as if planet Earth is drifting through space towards some great and dreadful climax. Well, you see, this world is drifting towards some great climax. And the climax is not the sun burning out, as some scientists may suggest, nor is it the earth being sucked into a black hole, neither is it the total extermination of life due to a nuclear war, World War III. The climax that this world is approaching is one which the Bible has foretold and described in abundant detail. The climax that the earth is drifting toward is the return of Jesus Christ to implement a solution and offer hope for this distressed world. So that was the bad news, the problem. And now we're going to talk about the good news, the solution that the Bible presents for this earth. It has been over four Sorry, not four, but 2,000 years since the Lord Jesus Christ walked the face of this planet, delivering a message from God that was a call to repentance from every evil work, an assertion of his divine sonship, an assertion of his Jewish kingship, and the fact that God would establish a kingdom on earth through him. This same Jesus was crucified, raised from the dead, taken up into heaven, and now awaits the appointed day, there's a set day when he will return to this earth. Now there is no doubt that Jesus will come back to this earth. 
God's purpose with the earth is based on the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there are many verses in the Bible where this is plainly taught. And we would like to tonight go through a simple exercise and take a look at some of these verses which establish the certainty of Jesus' second coming. So we're going to go through a number of passages, and it may be kind of quick, but all these passages are on the handout which has been distributed tonight. So you don't have to worry about trying to jot them all down. You can just reference the table in the middle of the page. Now in Acts chapter 1, Jesus, after being risen from the dead, is talking with his disciples. And as he is doing so, we read in verse 9 that he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner that ye have seen him go into heaven. And so we have a critical piece established for us. At the moment of Jesus' ascension, his rising up into heaven, the angels declared that he would also come back to the earth in the very same manner as they had seen him depart. Jesus wasn't on a one-way trip to heaven. The angels plainly declared that he would come back again. A couple chapters over, in Acts chapter 3, the Apostle Peter is preaching to the people. And he says in verses 20 and 21 that God shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So Acts chapter 1 told us that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, and here in chapter 3, Peter is telling us that Jesus was to abide or stay in heaven until a special time, an appointed time, at which time God would send him back to the earth. Heaven must receive Jesus until a set time when the kingdom of God would be established on earth. Now we'll just look at a few other passages or verses which further establish this point. And hopefully by the time we have completed this, we will see that the Bible places a great deal of emphasis on the return of Jesus Christ. So we'll start in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, where we read that the Son of Man, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. So the Son of Man, or Jesus Christ, will come again to reward every person according to his works. Next, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, we read that when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So we're told that Jesus will return for what purpose? Well, to sit upon a throne of glory. Luke chapter 21, verse 27 says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Once again, the emphasis is on the Son of Man coming from heaven to earth. And how does he come? Well, Luke 21 here tells us, with power and great glory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, we read that the members of the church at Corinth were waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're waiting for Jesus to come back. In another of Paul's letters, we read in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, this is consistent with what we've seen in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 3. For it is into heaven that Jesus ascended, and therefore it will be from heaven that Jesus will come. Thus Paul indicates that we expect to see Jesus return from heaven. And that is why in Philippians chapter 3 verse 20, the believers are looking to heaven for Jesus' return. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, we read that the believers were waiting for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And just a few pages over, in the same letter to the Thessalonians, in chapter 3, at verses 12 and 13, we see the writer once again refers to the return of Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, reading verses 12 and 13, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, you may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And the writer yet a third time, in the same letter to the Thessalonians in chapter 4, at verse 16, says that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So from all appearance of things, it would seem that Jesus Christ's second coming, Jesus Christ's return, plays a fairly large role in God's plan. Look at the sheer number of passages that have talked about Jesus Christ coming back. Now perhaps you aren't quite convinced of this yet. Then consider the following. If the reality of Jesus' return is a critical issue, then would it perhaps make sense for the Bible to leave off on that topic? If God's purpose with the earth, so if God's purpose with the earth is based on Jesus Christ's second coming, then wouldn't it only be reasonable that the final message conveyed to the reader of his word would be something along those lines? Well, have a look at this. In the last book of the Bible, that being the book of Revelation, in the very last chapter, chapter 22, and all the way to the second to the last verse of God's word, we read the following in verse 20. Out of the very mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ are the following words, Surely I come quickly. And the Apostle John, the writer of this book, responds by saying, Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. No doubt the certainty of the return of Jesus is clear from this relatively brief selection of verses that we have just considered. The verses that we have considered are conclusive in their teaching that Jesus Christ will come again to this earth. Now then, having established that the Bible supports the fact that there will be a second coming of Jesus Christ, we are naturally led to ask the question, when is he coming? Well, I suppose a simple answer would be any day now. But how do we know this? We know this because the Bible tells us what will be happening in this earth, in the world, prior to Jesus' return. And when we take these biblical indicators, or these biblical clues, and compare them with the world's present state of affairs, we see there is a match, and thus leading us to believe that Jesus Christ's return is soon. The Bible uses the term, the last days, to describe the period of time surrounding the return of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that decent standards will have been broken down in the last days. Furthermore, God's Word tells us that selfishness and evil will abound, and that the world would reel to and fro with distress and perplexity in the moments before Jesus' return. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, we read the following. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. So in the days before Jesus' return, what will be happening? People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Now, does that describe our society? About 2,000 years ago, the Bible predicted that these things would be occurring in our day, the last days. Now, there are also a couple references that we'd like to look at in the Gospel of Luke. 
In Luke chapter 17, verses 26 and 27, we read the following. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. That's referring to the day of the Son of Man's return. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. And just over a few chapters in Luke chapter 21, reading verses 34 to 35, But take heed to yourselves, lest your souls be weighed down with self-indulgence and drunkenness or the anxieties of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a falling trap, for it will come on all dwellers on the face of the whole earth. And if you look at the context there in Luke chapter 21, that day is the day of Jesus Christ's second coming. Materialism, disregard for common decency, self-indulgence of all kinds, and a deliberate choice of pleasure rather than serving God is the theme of these verses, and it is characteristic of our society. The Bible says that these things will be happening before the day of Jesus' second coming. Now, it's a general rule of thumb that mankind in general yearns for peace. Now, will peace be present when Jesus returns? You see, peace is a common longing, especially in those places where war has decimated the ranks of the young, destroyed towns and villages, and ravaged the countryside. Millions of humans have died at the hands of their fellows in all kinds of conflicts throughout the ages. And yet, despite declaring peace as an end goal, the art of warfare has been continually perfected by people. Long gone are the days of hand-to-hand -hand contact, combat. This is the day of intercontinental ballistic missiles, self-piloted aircraft, laser-guided missiles, and so on. All this state-of-the-art weaponry is intended to serve as a deterrent to war. It seems rather counterproductive in a way, doesn't it? In order to achieve peace and preserve life, technology has been created that has the capability of taking life. And in light of all this, what does the Bible have to say? Will a quiet, peaceful earth welcome the return of Jesus? Or will the present earth and royal and mounting conflict be the scene for Jesus' return? Well, the Bible teaches us that turmoil and distress will herald the second coming. Jesus Christ, not world peace. Consider the following passage in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, talking about the time of the end, the last days. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Furthermore, in Luke chapter 21, Verses 25 to 27, we read concerning the last days. There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts filling them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. You see, the disorder and suffering of this present world will only continue to build until Jesus is sent to establish his kingdom. Men and women will be full of uncertainty for fear of what this world is coming to. The last days will not be days of peace and prosperity, but days of violence, conflict, natural disasters, and distress. And such are our days now. Now we need not be discouraged by this, because to the believer of the Bible, there is nothing to fear. <clears throat> the world's troubles are a sign that Jesus Christ's return is imminent. The signs are definite and clear. The second coming of Jesus Christ is near. You see, nothing is prohibiting him or stopping him from coming back now. So if Jesus is going to return to the earth, and he's going to return soon, then we may ask, what exactly is he returning to do? Well, when Jesus returns, there will be vast world changes. 
There will be changes in the governments of the nations. There will be changes in the environment. There will be changes in the standards of mankind. Changes which will ultimately result in a solution to all of the problems this world is currently experiencing. So what is Jesus returning to do? Well, Jesus Christ is coming to judge the world in righteousness. In Acts chapter 17, verse 31, we read, He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. By the mighty power vested in him, Jesus Christ will discipline the world, bringing all mankind into subjection to his rule, and he will right the many wrongs which now exist. Jesus Christ is coming to establish a kingdom on earth over which he will be ruler. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, we read, The Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day there shall be one Lord, and his name one. Jesus Christ in glorious power will be the world ruler and initiate positive, positive change in the conditions that now exist in the earth. Jesus himself spoke of his kingship on numerous occasions. One of these was in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, where Jesus speaks of the time when he, the Son of Man, will sit in the throne of his glory. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. The Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. Clearly, then, we see that the entire political system of this world is going to come under new leadership. The governments of this earth are going to be overhauled and replaced by an administration led by Jesus Christ himself. But this kingdom, this new administration, will not be led by Jesus Christ alone. The Bible continues to tell us that there will be associates working with him. The associates working with Jesus in administering this new world government will be what the Bible terms the saints. And the saints are the faithful of all ages. These will be gathered together from both the living and the dead, who after the day of judgment receive the gift of immortality, the gift of eternal life. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, we are told that those who strive to follow Jesus Christ will also reign with him in the kingdom. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And in Daniel chapter 7, reading verses 18 and 27, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And in verse 27, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. The faithful of old, like Abraham, Moses, David, Ruth, Esther, along with the faithful, now alive, will live and reign with Jesus Christ in the kingdom. In the kingdom of the new age, the government will be invincible and incorruptible because it will be managed by Jesus Christ and his saints. This being the case, the laws of the kingdom will lead the nations to live in a right relationship with God and thereby have a proper relationship with between their fellow man. Isn't that the opposite of what is happening today? Today, mankind is drifting further and further away from God. And consequently, the earth is groaning under the burden of great troubles. Well, all kingdoms have a capital, don't they? And so does this one. The Bible teaches that the city of Jerusalem in Israel will be the world's capital. It is from this location, the city of Jerusalem, that Jesus and the saints will reign. 
Consider the following passage found in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17. At that time, the time of the kingdom, if you look at the context in Jeremiah 3, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. This must be futuristic, because it's certain hasn't happened in the past, and it's not the case right now. The city of administration for the kingdom will be Jerusalem. And it's amazing how many times Jerusalem is referred to as the future capital of Jesus' reign on earth in the Bible. Further support is found in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 23. Speaking of the age of the kingdom, the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. And also in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is yet to be. Jerusalem will be the city of the great king. And note that this last reference in Micah, chapter 4, also describes people voluntarily turning to God in the kingdom, seeking to learn his ways, and endeavoring to implement them as a way of life. What it describes is a vast difference to the attitude of many today when most are in opposition to God. Now in conjunction with the establishment of this new government, the physical world, nations and people will also undergo some serious transformations. In the kingdom of God, mankind will no longer learn war. Think about that. War will not be practiced anymore by the nations. There will be a harmony present among the nations which today's leaders can only dream of. The prophet Isaiah writes in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, And he that is Christ shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The weapons and armaments of this current age, the Bible says, will be made into farming tools. World armaments will be eliminated in the kingdom age. Can you imagine a time when true peace, national well-being, and international unity will exist throughout the entire world? The reign of Jesus Christ will rid the world of violence and introduce a state of world unity under one rule from Jerusalem. People will finally live in peace with one another. Surely, this will be a time and an age unique to anything else in history. The environmental crisis our world currently faces, global warming, Pollution, the shortage of natural resources, the extinction of species, and the list could go on. This crisis will no longer be a concern in the kingdom of God, because the Bible teaches that the earth will be restored and become exceedingly fruitful. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 through 7 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart. And the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. So the desert will no longer be a desert. There will be streams there. The parched ground will have water. Vast world changes are coming. To the environment. And finally, we are assured in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, 
that God shall wipe away all tears. There will be no more sorrow or crying, neither pain anymore or death for those in God's kingdom. God will wipe away all tears. What incredibly exciting and wonderful things God has in store for this earth. The items that we have just reviewed hardly even scratch the surface of what God has said is going to happen here on this earth. What will the kingdom of God be like? It will far surpass anything we could dream or imagine today. No doubt we would agree that God has revealed a great deal to us about the coming kingdom. And the Bible truly does paint a thrilling picture of worldwide peace, divine care, and restoration. What a wonderful hope and reassurance the Bible offers us as we stand in the midst of this troubled world. So where have we come so far? God at some point in the very near future is going to send his son back to the earth to establish a kingdom. What should we be doing to get ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus provides the answer to this question when he says in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And later in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. To get ready for the return of Jesus Christ, we must repent of past sins, turn to God, believe in the one true gospel, be baptized, and subsequently live a life of faithful obedience to God's commandments. Jesus Christ is coming quickly, and with him he brings the gift of eternal life to those of his servants who have been trying to uphold his commandments. In order to take part in the glorious age to come, we must be living now in a way that is pleasing and acceptable before God. If we desire to be one of the saints, ruling with Jesus from Jerusalem forever, let us heed the words of Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into that city. Tonight we have seen that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth. But not only that, his return is very soon. When Jesus returns, there will be vast changes to the current world. Changes which will result in a world that is filled with true peace, and righteousness. There is hope for this distressed world. That's good news. While the world's troubles can be disappointing and depressing, we must recognize that they are signs of Jesus' impending return. The Bible has told of a wonderful and exciting age that is to come upon this world that is centered on the second coming of Jesus Christ. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus begins this prayer by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus Christ, in perhaps one of the most well-known prayers, prays for the kingdom to come and for God's purpose with this earth to be accomplished. May we also likewise desire for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done on this earth, even as it is now done in heaven. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Are you ready?